we're live. I'm here at BC Wildlife Park with breaking news. Climate change is affecting all animals, but in different ways. I'm here with Pippin the goat to get some perspective. Pippin, how do you plan on regulating your body temperature during the next heat dome? Uh, what are your plans for a warmer world? Have you done any preparations? Duh. I'm working on getting answers, but I'm going to stay on this developing story. Back to you in studio. Clear. What we do know is that mammals have a hard time regulating their body temperature in excessive heat. We also know reptiles exist in extreme climates, so that got me wondering. Do we need to be cold-blooded for a warmer world? As kids, most of us learned that the animal kingdom can be divided into two groups, cold-blooded and warm-blooded. But those terms are inaccurate, implying that animals are in a never-ending struggle to stay warm or cool. Get ready for Ectotherm versus Endotherm 101 with Wagstaff. Ectothermic animals, like reptiles and amphibians, rely on the external environment to regulate their body temperatures. If it's too hot, these animals seek cooler places, and if it's too cold, they may find a sunny spot to warm up. They can also slow down their metabolisms, reducing their need to seek food until environmental conditions improve. Endotherms, like mammals, birds, and us humans, regulate body temperatures by producing heat within the body. But that takes a lot of energy, aka food. And that means they have to slog through rougher conditions, like extreme heat, because they can't power down the furnace or AC unit. Before we find out if we'll be living under a reptile overlord someday, know that the animal kingdom has already taken a big hit from climate change. When facing a warmer world, animals basically respond in one of three ways. Some adapt their behaviors, others undergo rapid evolution and pass down beneficial traits, and still others straight up die out. To learn more about how climate change is impacting animals, we met up with research biologist Carl Larson. And what better location than the BC Wildlife Park in Kamloops, a rehabilitation center for orphaned and injured animals. Okay, Carl and friends, how is climate change affecting animals? There's a myriad number of ways that it could happen. And I think that's what people are really trying to work on right now is mm -hmm. understanding the different mechanisms by which climate change can affect animals. And we know it's gonna have an effect. Um, with some animals, it's very obvious. They're, the habitat's gonna change. Some animals are gonna be trapped in some ways. And what are all the different sort of general tools that animals might have to, to, to change up with climate change? You know, I, th I think of hibernation right away. Right. A big concept is migration. And, and people think of migration as, well, the birds fly back for the summer. Um, but migration in a climate change context, really you're thinking about how is the species going to move across the landscape, particularly as habitat changes. So we're still trying to figure a lot of this out. I think so. I mean, it's very obvious for some species, like say um, high latitude species that are going to have their range of habitats expand. We may see increases in their range, but then also some animals say that are high elevation on mountains, um, like hoary marmots that depend on alpine habitat. Mm -hmm. Well, that may disappear completely, and so will the animals, at least in those areas. Hmm, let's go down the rabbit hole. Adam, this is a live stream into the marmots that are hibernating right now in this building. Uh, who are we looking at? So we're just looking at three of the marmots that are here, and this is Philip, Rowley, and Violet. We're kind of hoping that Philip and Violet will uh, reproduce in the spring. Ah, young love that we are witnessing at this moment. So they are in hibernation. Have you seen any trends in the past 20 years when it comes to climate change and changes to their hibernation? There's a lot of concern about how those lower snowpack might impact their hibernation. So they're really reliant on snow to provide a layer of insulation, kind of like a blanket over their hibernacula, these uh, underground chambers that they're actually digging and then hibernating in over the winter. 
those chambers should be a really constant steady temperature, but without the snow to insulate it, there's concern that those temperatures will vary. They might get colder, uh, and that would really impact the marmot's ability to stay warm. They'd have to use up a lot more body energy, produce a lot more body heat, and that could impact their survival. Marmots live, so Vancouver Island marmots, live in these subalpine bowls that are essentially kept tree-free by snow action. So avalanches and tree uh, snow creep scrape any vegetation that's on the hill, kind of off the hill, and that's especially true for bigger trees. But as the snow energy is reduced, its ability to have that clearing effect is reduced too. And we've been seeing, and it, and we've been seeing this for decades now, more and more trees invading these subalpine meadows, slowly converting these meadows from avalanche shoots and bowls into forest. And unfortunately for marmots, they're not a forest dwelling species. They really need that open space to detect predators, find food, dig hibernation chambers. And so that's a huge concern for them is losing this habitat. And that's something unfortunately that's been happening for, uh, again, at least 20 years now and is posed to increase in speed in the future. Carl, I wanted to ask you and Karina, the yes. rubber boa, yes. what kind of animal behaviors enhance the ability to survive? What qualities does Karina have that would give her the ability to survive during the heat dome? Like all reptiles and amphibians, she's an ectotherm. What that means is, uh, it gives them several big advantages. One is that they can tolerate a really wide range of temperatures. So for you or me, if our body temperature goes up one or two degrees or down one or two degrees, we're in trouble, right? It's fever, hypothermia. They have a body that's built for handling a range of temperatures. The other advantage is they don't have to eat as often or drink water because they're not fueling this big engine inside them that's geared to keeping their body temperature at this narrow range. What we found during the big heat dome a couple of years ago is most of our snakes that we were following through radio telemetry just went down in a hole and stayed there throughout the whole heat dome. And it probably wasn't the best situation and you know they definitely lost weight in that, but they could do that. You're good? Rolling. Rolling. Meet Veronica McKelvey, Carl Larson's master student. She tracks snake behavior. Veronica, tell me about your rattlesnake research. Yeah, so I study the overwintering behavior, not just of rattlesnakes actually, oh. also of Great Basin gopher snakes and Western yellow-bellied racers. So I got a, a little trilogy here, all three the of them, yeah. all the snakes. I'm like, give me all of them, yeah. So I look at their overwintering behavior, and what's really interesting about here in Canada is that we have winter. It's a big sort of roadblock for snakes. You know, they have to be able to survive in some way, and they use these really cool features that we have on the landscape called dens. So when I track the snake, I use a receiver and antenna. I turn it on and I put it to the unique frequency of the radio transmitter. When I turn it on, should be. And I basically hot and cold find it, you know what I mean? Like, oh, it's louder this way. Sometimes it takes a long time, but it should get me to the exact location of the snake. So for the dens, they're gonna be inside, especially in the winter time. But what's really cool is that these dens provide structural, thermal, and humidity conditions for the snakes to survive over winter. So we learned earlier, they're ectotherms, right? So in order to survive, they have to have that nice air temperature that is in their range of survival. If they're out here in the winter, it's probably like, once we hit those negative 20s, I'm sorry, the done snake for. is done for. Yeah, exactly. So they have these nice dens tucked away. And what I'm really interested in is this communal feature that some snakes exhibit. So they'll come to these dens, but congregate. And it's really interesting because we usually associate snakes as being solitary, kind of alone. And so there's a few different theories about why communal denning occurs. And the one I'm most interested in is this idea that there is not enough dens, and especially here in these northern latitudes where we see communal denning increasingly. So interesting, yeah. and with climate change and the sort of rise in elevation, this really ties in. Right, yeah. Well, we could expect changes as a result to this because we see snakes more down south not communally denning. Hmm. And so this behavior is really unique up in higher latitudes. So it could be shifting as a result of climate change as well. And what do you call that ability to adapt uh, in, in, within a wider range? So we refer to 
behaviors or any adaptation is either being canalized or plastic. And um, they're relative terms, but canalized means um, it's really honed in and, and selection has fine-tuned it. Do you want to hold her? Kind of, yeah. Bit, yeah. Tell uh, me about your plastic qualities. Yeah, and, and so a, a plastic trait is one that's very malleable and the animal can use it in a lot of different circumstances. And think about coyotes living in... Oh, my uh, yeah, thinking about coyotes living in, you know, the deserts of Mexico or downtown Vancouver, um, they've got very plastic traits that allow them to live in a lot of different conditions. But then we may have specialists that are very hard tuned to certain conditions. And if those shift or change, um, that'll be problems. And uh, like a good example I always think about is some little salamander that needs to live in a damp, cool mm -hmm. forest. Um, or maybe salmon? Yeah, uh, salmon, I mean, it, that, and that's a really good example because we know salmon get stressed now if they're going up streams and there's, you know, extreme temperature differences, like, it, or if the water's warmer than not, that can cause problems. So having plastic qualities like Karina's ability to just go underground during a heat dome right. in the middle of the summer is, is advantageous in climate change. The big unknown is what's going to happen to their prey. And that's another, another level that we, we still need to f try and understand. Salmon and salamanders aren't the only species that need specific conditions to thrive. Honeybees are also in trouble, and that includes the ones in our cities. That was some good honey. Honey that was made by these very bees on the roof of CBC Vancouver. Bet you didn't know we had beehives on top of our headquarters. Now these bees right in here are inactive because it's winter time. I'm not even gonna open the lid because they literally could die. They're maintained by the Vancouver Honeybees Community Beekeepers, whose whole mission is uh, environmentally friendly and sustainable beehives in urban areas. Now, those beekeepers say that these bees are doing great, but bees are susceptible to climate change. First of all, droughts and extreme heat can dry out the very flowers that bees pollinate and go to, and extreme rain events makes it hard for bees to fly to the flower diversity that they need. And also, the season is extending, which means the window for viruses and mites to get into the colonies is also extending. And new studies say that the pollen actually changes flavor with a larger season. All that being said, humans can help. We can plant more diverse gardens and let our flowers reseed themselves. Thanks, bees.